Thank you so much for having me. And um, it's been so great to be here. I'm obviously always happy to be anywhere where Bill O'Reilly can't interrupt me. Um, I say that at every speech, and I mean it just as much every single time. Um, but uh, I, you know, I like to be able to finish my sentences because I like free speech. And um, unfortunately, free speech is under attack right now on our nation's campuses, and I think at our society at large, but particularly on our nation's campuses. And debate and um, dissent have really become um, not the norm on our campuses, and they've been replaced by a sort of reflexive groupthink that's antithetical to uh, honest inquiry and the pursuit of knowledge, which I think is what's supposed to be happening on campuses. And this new, intellect, this, this new climate of intellectual coddling um, is really making a mockery of our, I think, Americans' unparalleled commitment to free speech, which um, you know, we are here, I think, in part to honor on Constitution Day, the First Amendment, um, which really stands out, I think, among countries as a, a really special kind of protection for speech that we just, we should never take for granted. Um, and many of the attempts to silence free speech on campuses are not violations of the Constitution, though many are. Uh, many public universities, for example, have uh, so-called free speech zones or speech codes, which are violations of the First Amendment. But many of the attacks that are happening on campuses are, they're not, they're not violations of the Constitution. They're an unofficial kind of silencing. Um, and they're accomplished through bullying and intimidation and through ostracizing and delegitimizing and demonizing people who express the wrong views. They have the wrong ideas, or maybe they just use the wrong speech to express those ideas. Um, and Supreme Court um, Justice Louis Brandeis wrote in 1927, those who want our independence believe that freedom to think as you will and speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth. But it's getting harder and harder to exercise this fundamental freedom on our campuses where speech police are on the prowl looking for people who have um, who violated uh, the, I guess, the, the ultimate thing now in our, in our culture, which is they've offended somebody. Um, and so you have, uh, students who have been forced off campus newspapers. You have professors and students who have become targets of Title IX investigations or intimidating Freedom of Information Act requests merely for expressing the wrong point of view or the wrong idea or saying it the wrong way. And campus speakers who question liberal orthodoxy have been forced off of campuses. They've been disinvited. They have been uh, the targets of smear campaigns and speech disruptions. The few that actually managed to make it onto campus um, often uh, probably wish that they hadn't. <laughs> and uh, you know, pro-life students have been compared to white supremacists and terrorists in an effort to silence them, to keep them from expressing their views on campus. Trying to determine what could potentially offend somebody has become a fool's errand. You have Cal State soror sorority sisters who were forced to publicly repent for their Taco Tuesday event, or a New Hampshire college uh, uh, the administration disinvited a band, it was an Afrobeat band, because there weren't enough white, or there were too many white members. And of course, Yale students, many people have heard of this one, were, were told that they could not use the word sissies on a t-shirt describing Harvard students, even though this was a quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald. But others are less silly. Uh, at Vanderbilt University, the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship was told that they uh, could not require their student leaders to believe in the Bible. It's a Christian group. And the head of the group actually said to the administrators, are you telling me that I can't believe, I can't require my Bible study teachers to believe in the Trinity? And they said, yes, that's exactly what we're telling you, because that might offend somebody. Or what if you believe the most qualified person should get the job? According to the University of California, that would make you a racist. The phrase, America is the land of opportunity and America is a melting pot, were both deemed racial microaggressions by this taxpayer-funded institution. A racial microaggression, if you're not familiar with it, is an intentional or, or unintentional, it doesn't matter if you didn't mean to hurt anybody's feelings or offend anybody, um, if, but if it communicates some sort of racial slight, um, then you have committed an act of aggression. Now obviously, using racially offensive language is wrong, that there's no question about that, but that's not what this is about. Uh, this is taking what is often even like polite small talk and turning into an act of aggression. 
according to the Facebook page of Princeton Group, that tracks microaggressions, what counts as harmless banter to some may be emotionally triggering to others. Which I think if you're a student, probably would make you think, I'm just not gonna say anything. Why, why even take the chance of offending somebody? Um, according to the University of California, it's also a racist microaggression to mispronounce the student, a student's name who has asked you to pronounce it a certain way repeatedly, um, which I will definitely remember the next time Sean Hannity calls me Kirsten instead of Kirsten, um, which happens too often. Um, and, but in all seriousness, th th these, these are, this is a, a major accusation to make against someone, right? A racial microaggression, it's not a minor thing. Um, and in November of 2013, a group of students uh, went into, the, uh, into the, the room of a professor there, surrounded him and accused him of, of quote, engage, creating a hostile and unsafe climate for scholars of color. The students claimed that they had been victims of racial microaggressions. And an example of a racial microaggression by this really beloved professor who had been teaching for a long time was that he had told a student to um, not capitalize the word indigenous, so he said it should be lowercase. And this was allegedly an attack on this student's ideological point of view. Of course, when I was growing up, this was called teaching, but um, now it's an aggressive act of intolerance. And of course, there are sexist, sexist microaggressions as well, and an example that has been given at the University of California, again, is uh, you ask somebody, a uh, woman, how old she is, when she says she's 31, and you glance at her ring finger, you have committed an act of aggression. It is a sexist microaggression because you are suggesting, even if you aren't, that you are suggesting that she should be married because women's only role in life is to be married. So be careful. Uh, other sexist microaggressions include the statements, men and women have equal opportunities for achievement and gender plays no part in who we hire. Now it's tempting and many people do laugh this off and they say, oh, this is silly, it doesn't matter. But it stops being funny if you're the person who's been called a misogynist or a racist or a homophobe or a bigot because you expressed the wrong idea or you said something that you didn't even know was wrong. You were just making polite small talk, you were just trying to be nice, and now you're, you're one of these horrible, you've been called one of these horrible names. And for professors, their career and reputation literally hangs in the balance, and for students, you can see that such missteps have had the potential to do serious harm to their academic standing. At Washington State University, an instructor informed students that they were banned from using various words such as referring to women as females and men as males. The professor warned on the class syllabus that use of such, quote, oppressive and hateful language will be handled accordingly, including but not limited to removal from the class without attendance or participation points, failure of the assignment, and in extreme cases, failure for the semester. What if you consider yourself a proud American? That's problematic at the University of New Hampshire, according to their bias-free language guide that they posted on the university website. Students and faculties were advised that they should say resident of the United States or US citizen so as to not offend people from South America. Other offensive words include mothering and fathering, which the college advised should be re replaced with parenting to quote, avoid gendering a non-gendered activity. This is straight out of a George Orwell novel. It's more than just a language preference or an attempt to avoid hurt feelings. It's thought control and it's forced conformity to an ideological agenda that in this case seeks to diminish patriotism and support for the traditional family. Now, if that is the point of view that, that, that somebody on the campus has, if they wanna make the case that it's offensive for citizens of the United States of America to refer to themselves as Americans, or that uh, it's offensive to, um, you know, to believe that children need a mother and a father, then they can make that case. I am actually not arguing against the idea that they can make that case. They can. But what they shouldn't be able to do is they shouldn't be able to cast anybody who disagrees with them or even wants to debate them about it as some sort of biased speech criminal, which is exactly what, what is happening. And the University of New Hampshire Guide explained that this, this, this speech policing was, quote, not a means to censor, but rather to create dialogues of inclusion where all of us feel comfortable and welcomed. In Orwell's 1984, the ruling party used contradictory slogans such as ignorance is strength and slavery is freedom to keep citizens in a constant state of fear and confusion. 
Likewise, at the University of New Hampshire, students and faculty are told that certain speech must be banned to create dialogues. How do, you, how do you create a dialogue by banning speech? That makes no sense. But, but this is very typical of the, kind of, of the kind of speech codes that we're seeing. And when they say that they're going to, they're doing this all for all of us, what they really mean is that they're doing it for everybody who thinks like them. It's not really for everybody. There's no proliferation of speech codes on college campuses that keep, tell people not to offend Christians or conservatives, and there sh nor should there be. I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying they don't exist. Um, according to the 2015 report on speech codes by the Foundation for Individual Rights and Freedom, it's called, also called FIRE, of the 437 schools they surveyed, more than 55% of schools maintain severely restrictive red light speech codes, policies that clearly and substantially prohibit protected speech. These codes are particularly dangerous because they're so subjective and they really are left to interpretation by the administrators and by the faculty who are overwhelmingly liberal. And so what is offensive is left up to them to decide. Which is why in the hundreds of complaints that FIRE receives every year, they say that the vast majority are from people who have been censored from the left. I want to be really clear about this because I think people often don't completely appreciate this because it is somewhat ironic, I think, that the, the assault that's happening on free speech on campuses is not equal opportunity. It's not happening. It's not a both sides do it kind of situation. Um, it is something that is coming really from the left. In, in my book, The Silencing, I, I call them the illiberal left because they're so illiberal. They don't, they, they say that they're liberal, but they really just have no respect for these really central uh, tenets of liberalism, such as free speech, debate, and dissent. And this doesn't mean that all liberals do this. In fact, I would argue most liberals don't do this, including most liberals on campus don't do it. And I'm also not saying that conservatives never do it. That's also not true. Um, it's just, you'll, as you'll see, they don't get a lot of sympathy when they do it uh, from, from the administrators. Um, it just means that the people who are largely doing this, that are largely squelching free speech, are, on the, are, are the political left, and the people being censored are typically being censored from the left. And there was, a, was an article this year, uh, was a couple months ago, it was in Vox, it's a liberal website, and the headline was, I am a liberal professor and I am terrified of my liberal students. And this professor was so terrified that he wrote under a pseudonym. So he, he wasn't, didn't even feel safe to talk about uh, this publicly. And he was at a mid-sized, unidentified university, and he said that he has noticed something has changed, that now students really can affect the, the career track of their professors by claiming offense. And he used an example of a, an adjunct professor who didn't have their contract renewed because a student had been offended when this professor uh, assigned a Mark Twain book. And he went on to write that he um, is on his anonymous blog. He wrote, saying anything that goes against liberal orthodoxy is now grounds for a firing. Even if you make a reasonable and respectful case, if you so much as cause your liberal students a second of complication or doubt, you face the risk of demonstrations, public call-outs, and severe professional consequences. He noted that this has created a, quote, academic climate where teachers are afraid to make students think. But what if a conservative student complains? He said he doesn't worry about this because he writes, I would not get fired for angering a Republican so long as I did it respectfully and so long as it happened in the course of legitimate classroom instruction. Case in point, at Marquette University last year, a student uh, was told by an instructor that they could not raise gay marriage, or could not debate gay marriage in a classroom setting because it was, quote, not appropriate and homophobic. The student complained to the administration, he was ignored, and uh, he felt his free speech was, you know, he was being silenced, they didn't care. He went and he talked to another professor. This professor uh, posted on his blog, he told the story, he blasted uh, the university and, and this uh, professor, this instructor for not allowing free speech and debate in the classroom. And the way that the university responded was they sent him a letter and they told him he was under investigation. They didn't tell him what he was under investigation for. They told him he was banned from campus. And now they are trying to revoke his tenure. And Marquette's hostility of free speech did not end here. They 
also, in a, around the same time, there was a, a teacher training session where there was a slide and it showed two students talking and they were talking about the fact that they opposed same-sex marriage. They weren't saying anything you know, nasty or horrible, they're just saying, you know, I, I don't support same-sex marriage. A third student overhears this and is offended and reports it to the university administrators and the university says this was handled correctly. And I think it's, I'm hard pressed to think of something that is more intellectually chilling than the idea that students cannot engage in, in, a, in a conversation about what they believe on campus um, and, and that, it, that somehow other students are turned into informants on them to report them to the, to the campus administrators because they are expressing views that are not sanctioned by university authorities. Another big issue on campuses has become abortion, which is an issue the country is actually evenly divided on. Greg Lukianoff, who is the liberal atheist head of the group I mentioned before, FIRES, a free speech group, who is also a pro-choice, says that he, um, his, his organization proudly defends the free speech rights of, of pro-choice people, but he says that they are far more likely to come to the fence of people who are pro-life. And just as an example of how really out of control this has gotten, at Northern Kentucky University, a professor told her students that they needed to exercise their free speech rights and destroy another student's pro-life display. And she was captured on video with her students um, tearing up the little white crosses that had been planted to uh, protest the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Um, and this was all done in the name of free speech. And at Dartmouth College, a similar situation happened where a student had plowed over with his car uh, a, a bunch of little American flags that had been set up to protest uh, abort. It was a, well, a pro-life pro uh, demonstration. And um, ironically, on the car as he's plowing over these, these little flags is a little coexist bumper sticker. Um, <laughs> At Johns Hopkins, a pro-life group was denied university status because, um, what, well, because they would offend the wrong people, obviously, but also they were compared to white supremacists. These were, it was just a peaceful organization. They were gonna handle some literature. Um, and um, a student government association member told a reporter that the anti-abortion rights demonstrators made her feel, quote, personally violated, targeted, and attacked at a place where we previously felt safe and free to live our lives. And an SGA leader told a reporter that we have the right to protect our students from things that are uncomfortable. But students are supposed to be uncomfortable with ideas on campuses. They should feel physically safe, but they should intellectually feel challenged. And if, if, they, if a student disagrees with a certain point of view, then they should be encouraged to articulate that, to persuade, to debate, um, and, 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 and to make their case, and to learn how to make that case, not to just silence people and, compare them to white supremacists. Um, furthermore, I think we can we probably have a good idea of how this student government association leader would respond if a pro-life student had said, I don't feel safe with a pro-choice demonstration on campus. I, I don't think anybody would care. Um, and again, I'm not endorsing the pro-life student doing that. I don't think they should. I think pro-choice students should be able to hold demonstrations to their heart's content. Um, Speaking of pro-life demonstrations, this is one of the worst examples in my book, um, but it's very emblematic of the situation. And this was a University of California, Santa Barbara professor who physically attacked a 16-year-old peaceful pro-life demonstrator, stole her sign, and destroyed it. And when she was arrested, she told the police that she was triggered by the poster's graphic images, called the peaceful demonstrators terrorists, and told police she had a moral right to her behavior and was just setting a good example for her students. She told the officer who arrested her that her rights had been violated by the presence of a pro-life demonstration on campus. When the officer asked her what right had been violated, she said, my right to go to work and not be in harm. The police reported her as asserting that her actions were in defense of her students and her own safety. Though she was found guilty of grand theft, vandalism, and battery, she was never publicly censured by the university and still has a job at this taxpayer-funded institution. But most telling about this situation was, was not just her behavior, but how students and faculty across the country responded to the situation, coming to her defense and actually blaming the demonstrators for provoking this violent response. 
And UCSB's chancellor, in a statement alluding to outsiders and provocateurs who peddle hate and intolerance, seemed to sympathize more with the professor than with the victims of her crime. Even satire is under attack on campuses. In 2013, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, the student newspaper ran a satirical piece for their annual April Fool's issue. It gently mocked the, the gender studies department. It was nothing really particularly offensive about it. Um, but the gender studies professor was offended. And she claimed that this was creating a, quote, hostile environment and, include, and accused the newspaper of sexual harassment. It led to um, multiple complaints. She lodged multiple complaints against the newspaper. And one resulted in a Title IX investigation. Um, for against a newspaper for practicing constitutionally protected free speech. The irony here is that the student who wrote the satirical piece uh, was in, her, in fact herself a pro-choice feminist um, who just thought it was funny. She, she didn't think that, that it was satire. It was an April Fool's Day issue. And, um, but it didn't matter. She ended up having her life turned upside down for eight months as she was investigated as this professor went around telling everybody that she was a sexual harasser. Um, and and uh, it was, again, it's just another taxpayer-funded institution. It's a clear violation of the First Amendment. And they only backed down. It's not clear that they ever would have backed down. They only backed down when they were threatened with a lawsuit, when they were told, you're violating the First Amendment. You have to stop. And, and then they finally did. Um, and this was not an isolated incident. There was another case at the University of Michigan where a, a student there named Omar Mahmoud he wrote a satirical piece mocking political correctness at the university. He, is a, he describes himself as a conservative and libertarian. He's Muslim. And he wrote a funny riff on political correctness on campus. And he wrote of his struggles with, as a man of color, having to face white privilege everywhere, including, quote, white snowflakes falling thick upon the autumn leaves, burying their colors. He wrote sarcastically of the indignities he faced for being left-handed and how his humanity was reduced to my handiness. Mimicking the language of overwrought victimhood that has become so endemic on campuses today, he complained that, quote, the University of Michigan does literally nothing to combat the countless instances of violence we encounter every day. Whenever I walk into a classroom, I can far hardly find a left-handed desk to sit in. In big lecture halls, I met with the stairs as I walk up the aisle along the left-handed column. The university cannot claim to be my school and continue to oppress me. For this, he was informed by the editor of the Michigan Daily, another pa paper that he wrote for, and he's a regular contributor, that he had created a hostile environment and that someone on that, the staff of that newspaper had felt threatened by what I just read to you. His column was suspended at the other newspaper, and he was told if he wanted to keep it, he would have to issue an apology. He refused. But as he was being cast as the aggressor that was making everybody unsafe and feeling threatened, his apartment was vandalized in the middle of the night. It was, it was covered with obscene statements and a, a picture of the devil, and hot dogs and eggs were thrown at his door. One thing that may have already become clear to you is that in this new paradigm, Disagreement with certain liberal ideas, um, it's never sincere. It's never something that's a, that, that needs to be debated. It's either misogyny or racism or homophobia or, um, most importantly, violence. Um, in this paradigm, they have turned speech into an actually a violent act. At Johns Hopkins, approach with the approach to his students said they were personally violated, targeted, and attacked by the mere idea of a pro-life demonstration. Omar Mahmoud's satirical piece threatened people. The professor who corrected somebody's spelling had committed a racial microaggression. The casting of disagreement with the expression of non-sanctioned views as violence or aggression is a way to justify cracking down on speech because if, if something's violent, how can you not do something about it? How can you not act to stop the violence? Um, it's also an effective way to delegitimize people. Um, if, if they're violent, then um, then, then why should they be on campus? Why should we listen to them? Um, and in, in 2012, Wendy Kaminer, who is a, a liberal free speech a activist, was at a, a conference, uh, on a Smith College conference, talking about free speech in academia. And somebody brought up the issue of Huckleberry Finn and said, you know, some people don't think that should be taught on campus because the use of the N-word is offensive to people. And Wendy Kaminer said, okay, um, 
what do you hear when, you, when I say the N-word? And the audience said back to her the full word. And then she repeated it back and she said, okay, see, I said that and, and we're okay. And you know, is it something I would have done? Probably not. Uh, but, but I can appreciate that it was a provocative attempt to show that certain language actually can be tolerated in certain contexts, um, such as in, the, in, in classical, classic literature. I'm not sure I reached the same conclusion as her, but I understand what she was trying to do. But instead of debating that with her, um, she, was, she was accused by the editor of the Smith newspaper of engaging in an explicit act of racial violence, and she was accused of making racist comments. Northwestern film professor Laura Kipnis had a similar experience when she wrote an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education called Sexual Paranoia Strikes Academe. Students protested the article and demanded that the university do something about the violence expressed in Kipnis's article. But the article didn't have any violent language in it whatsoever. It's just that Kipnis had expressed a view that these students didn't like and that, that they didn't agree with. And incredibly, the university complied with the request to do something, and they launched a Title IX investigation into this popular professor um, and really dragged her through the mud. And she was thankfully ultimately cleared of it, but I think the message was sent loud and clear. Another, another person who has experienced this kind of treatment is Christina Hoff Summers. She's an AEI scholar. She's a critical liberal feminism and a proponent of something called equity feminism, her, her view of feminism. And she went to both Georgetown University and Oberlin College um, about three months ago. And in both cases, she was met um, by um, a sort of hysterical response, is really the only way to put it. Before she even set foot on Oberlin's campus, the student newspaper published an open letter in response to a speech that had not yet been given, um, saying that, um, well, we can't cancel, we can't get this speech canceled, but at least we can stand together in the face of this violence. And the violence here was that Christina Hoff Summers has been a critic of the methodology that's used to, um, to, to determine the rate of, of rape on campuses. Um, she doesn't dispute that rape occurs or that rape is bad, um, but she has questioned the methodology. But for this, she was deemed dangerous and she was called a rape apologist, um, which is absurd. She's, she's not a rape apologist. And Oberlin's, um, so ironically, Oberlin's administration was so concerned about the sort of hysteria that was happening online in advance of her um, speech that they had to um, have give her a police escort to the speech. Um, while the students who had inspired the police escort were holding a safe space um, where they could all gather because they couldn't handle her being on campus. And at Georgetown, it was pretty much the same thing. They had to give her, camp they put sent security into the audience um, you know, to protect her basically from the people who were accusing her of being dangerous. And you had a campus feminist sort of flooding her speech, holding signs such as trigger warning, anti-feminism, putting hearing a differing view on the same level as post-traumatic stress disorder, a very serious illness. Trigger warnings, I'm sure, are something everyone has heard about. They're the new rage on campus. Um, and they are, you know, like microaggressions, they are very amorphous. There's, they could be anything. Oberlin College administrators explained anything can be a trigger, a smell, a song, a scene, a phrase, a place, a person, and so on. And professors were told to try to avoid, avoid these. Um, books that were deemed uh, needing a trigger warning are The Great Gatsby and Mrs. Dalloway, Virginia Woolf's uh, famous book. And the subject, subject of colonialism, for example, can also be a trigger. This obviously makes things very difficult for professors um, who want, who need to have freedom, need to have academic freedom to teach, but are being told that anything they say could potentially send somebody into an emotional, have an emotional meltdown. Um, but one of the things that really stands out to me is that the people who are sort of portraying themselves as the victims actually are the aggressors. Um, and when you look at the way they attach these sort of toxic monikers to people, so look at Christina Hoff Summers, she's you know, she's a rape apologist. So who wants to listen to a rape apologist, right? I mean, so, is, you know, before she's even said anything, she's been completely delegitimized, um, even though she's coming to talk about actually something completely different. Um, and they're sending the message to anybody else who's thinking of inviting her that, she, you know, if you do that, you better be ready because it's going to be contested, it's going to be controversial, and we're going to make things very difficult for you. Um, and, and anybody who says things like she says, um, it's not, you know, they're creating these safe spaces, but really I don't think it's about keeping people safe. I think 
it's about silencing certain views. And the safe spaces are in themselves sort of an intimidation tactic because if Christina Hoff Summers or any speaker requires a safe space, then what does that mean? They're dangerous. If you're dangerous, you probably shouldn't be on campus. Um, and you know, if you are somebody that requires students to be sort of coddled and protected, then, then it, it was, it's probably a good idea not to have you there in the first place. And I think that that's the message that they're trying to send. Um, and I just wanna say that there are obviously people who are legitimately suffering from PTSD. There are people who legitimately are triggered by certain things, and I think that those people should be treated respectfully. And I think that you know, if someone's going to be triggered, we, sh we should take that into consideration. I just think the chances of being someone being triggered by a speech on equity feminism are probably fairly low. Um, but if that exists, then th that person needs intervention. They need counseling. They don't need to be used as a prop in some sort of ideological stunt. And I, anything needs a safe space on campus, it's free speech. Hoff Summer says she has been le lecturing on campuses for 20 years. She has, she's used to people disagreeing with her. She's used to people coming and debating her. Um, and, and that's the way it's always been. And she says something has changed. Something where now the students, they don't want to debate her. They don't want to even argue with her. They just don't want her to be on campus. They don't want her views to be expressed. And many commentators have, have talked about this kind of behavior and they've blamed it on helicopter parenting. They've said basically, these are emotionally fragile children, you know, they're adults, but they're acting like children, they're, they're, they're snowflakes, and, and sort of saying that, that the problem here is emotional fragility. But I, I think that that's, that's probably part of the problem, but I don't think it's the whole problem. And I also think it's a little insulting, frankly, to millennials, because I, in my experience with millennials has not been that they all um, are emotionally fragile and unable to hear different views. And in fact, most people, in most of these incidents, you'll find there are a lot of people who wanted to hear these views. And this, this group of people are so loud and so toxic that they, they, don't, they, they make it impossible for everybody else. I, I think the real problem with them is, is less their emotional fragility and more the fact that they are so authoritarian, that they really don't want certain views expressed. Because if it was just about hurt feelings, then they wouldn't need to disrupt a speech to the young Republicans. They would just not go to the speech. And so they've taken it to a different level. It's not just the regular intolerance of I don't want to hear something. It's I don't want anybody to hear it. And this, this is a little different than, you know, than, I, than your sort of garden variety intolerance, which is a problem as well. But at least they would let other people hear what they want to hear or have the discussions that they want to have with other people. And the other thing is I think we have to remember that a lot of this speech policing is not just the students. They couldn't get away with this if the administrators and faculty weren't complicit in it. And I don't have any reason to believe that they had helicopter parents or that they're emotionally fragile. And they are, you know, they're as much the perpetrators here as anybody else. Um, there's also an ideological backdrop to this, which is that in the liberal progressive uh, sort of legal um, community, there's been a shift in sort of the understanding of the First Amendment, the understanding of sp speech, and not surprisingly, they are now often, often casting speech as violence, as speech as being harmful, as speech as being dangerous. And um, liberal First Amendment scholar Floyd Abrams, I interviewed him for my book, and, and he talked about the fact that he runs the First Amendment Center at Yale, and he said, of all of the progressive legal scholars who come through that center, that they, not, almost none of them see the First Amendment as a protection um, against government power, you know, as a bulwark against government intrusion or government power, but instead they see it as an impediment to progressive legal policy. And I said, well, what do they say when you tell them? Because he, he's this iconic liberal First Amendment scholar. I said, well, what do, you, you know, what do, you, what do they say when you tell him like, the traditional liberal view of the First Amendment? And he said, they've never heard it. Um, you know, that in, in, and he has noted in another speech, he said, it stuns me how many people, educated people, including scholars, seem to believe that the First Amendment should be interpreted as nothing but an extension and an embodiment of their generally liberal political views. And I think that, you know, if you really want to understand what's going on here, and I, this is what struck me when I was writing my book, is that for, ironically, for people who you know, would say that they hate religious fundamentalists, they behave very much like religious fundamentalists, um, except they're secular religious fundamentalists, in the sense that they sort of treat their bullying 
And intimidation is, is a self-righteous crusade. It's, you know, it's, it's for the good. It's for the protection of the greater truth. You know, it, it sort of makes them holy. You know, that they're, they're so right and you're so wrong. And that you need to be, you need to be silenced. Um, you know, facts and arguments don't particularly move them. And they don't, they can't tolerate disagreement because they have the capital T truth. It's, you, like I said, they like to say the debate is over. There's nothing to talk about because they've figured it out. Um, and I think that it explains why they would treat dissent as, as, some, as an act of aggression that needs to be you know, squashed immediately. Um, and unfortunately, they're having a lot of success. Um, when liberal HBO host Bill Maher, who, you know, if any of you watch him, he's probably reserves the majority of his contempt for Christians and for conservatives, he was invited to speak at Berkeley. And it wasn't the conservatives who complained about him coming. In fact, the head of the, the college Republicans said, she was more than happy to have him come and hear what he had to say. Um, the people who had the problem were on the left, and their problem was that he had engaged in this, what they called hate speech, in his comments about, about Muslims. And you know, I don't think that they were trying to create a safe space or were worried about hurt feelings. I think they were sending a very clear message, which is if you say these kinds of things, we're going to call you a racist, we're going to accuse you of hate speech, all the things they did with Marr. Um, so that people won't say things that they don't like. Like, that, that is really the point of it. Which leads us to the issue that I like to call commencement shaming, uh, which is where you take a, what is meant to be an honor, being invited to give a commencement speech, and turn it into some sort of high profile humiliation. Um, and for the last many years, we had headlines about conservatives being disinvited, or at least forced in, you know, pressured into withdrawing from giving commencement speeches, like, Condoleezza Rice or Christine Lagarde, who were two of the most accomplished women in the country, um, after there was outcry from lefty students and faculty. And according to the Free Speech Group Fire, this is not, it's not your imagination. This is actually happening a lot more than it used to happen. They said in the six years through 2009, there were as many speech cancellations, 62, than in the preceding 22 years. They found that conservatives were targeted with twice the frequency um, as liberal speakers, and that if you're going to face a disinvitation push, it's about three times as likely it's going to come from your left. So, to show you just how effective it's been, last year in the commencement season, there were 25 Democratic political figures who spoke at the commencement addresses of 60, 60 of America's top universities. There were no Republicans invited. Now, I think the universities have just decided that it's not worth the headache of offending liberal students, or conservatives have decided, you know, I'm not gonna accept this invitation and then be humiliated in front of the whole country, and so they're just not accepting them. But whatever is happening, the speech police are winning. This is exactly what's supposed to happen. Meanwhile, last week, 8,000 conservative evangelical students gathered at Liberty University to hear the non-religious, Jewish, pro-choice, pro-gay marriage, Social as a Democrat, Bernie Sanders deliver a convocation speech, and there was no trigger warning. The silencing campaign is not a problem just for the individuals who get caught in the, their crosshairs. I mean, we, should, we should obviously should care about them, um, but I think it's a problem for all of us, even setting that aside. Because freedom requires the structures of, of um, it's, it requires more than the structures of just a liberal constitution or a just legal system. It requires a spirit of freedom, which is passed from generation to generation. This insight, which comes from the 18th century philosopher Montesquieu, was famously applied in um, Alexis de Tocqueville's book, Democracy in America, in which he observed that America owes its freedom not so much to the law as to the habits of the heart of freedom-loving American citizens. And what's happening is these habits of the heart are being, they're starting to be eradicated. We're starting to forget, well, you know, you're having students who are st starting to learn that, um, no, we actually don't live in a culture that values free speech. We don't live in a culture that's going to let you make a mistake. Um, and if you offend the wrong people, um, then, then you'll be punished. And we're not, we're, we're being taught that you don't need to have the bruising clash of ideas. You know, this is something I think for a long time everybody sort of accepted that this is how we, we figure out what truth is. This is how, it's not just handed down to us. We actually put ideas out in the world and we, we, um, we let people respond to them and we, we sort of let people hold them up and, and tell us what's wrong with them or what's right with them. And, um, 
you know, and I think that it's it's something that you know Steven Pinker, who's the Harvard psychologist, he's a, he's a libertarian, um, who's been very very critical of of this crackdown on free speech on campuses, and he he likes to invoke Karl Popper, who talks about you know the way we achieve knowledge is is through conjecture and refutation, but that presumes free speech because without it, you're going to be afraid. You're going to be afraid to put out. What, what is your? Why would you you know engage in conjecture if you're afraid that somebody's going to um, attack you and, and tell you that you're you know a racist or, or something like that because you just thought the wrong thing. And so if we can't do that, then people can't test their ideas. Um, people can't make mistakes. And I think that people should be able to make mistakes, especially on college campuses. I mean, if, if nowhere else, they should be able to make mistakes. Um, John, I like to quote philosopher John Stuart Mill because he says it best, mankind ought, mankind ought to have a rational assurance that all objections have been satisfactorily answered, and how are they to be answered if that which requires to be answered is not spoken? Or how can the answer be known to be satisfactory if the objectors have no opportunity of showing that it's unsatisfactory? And this is the process that I think the liberal left is trying to short circuit. They're trying to short circuit the process of, of gaining knowledge at the exact place it's supposed to be happening, which is on college campuses. And in fact, President Obama uh, recently reflected on this trend, and he talked about how, um, he, and he said specifically that liberal students were doing this um, on campuses. And he says, I quote him, anybody who comes to speak to you and you disagree with them, you should have an argument with them, but you shouldn't silence them. That's not the way we learn. I've shared today some stories, and there are so many more, unfortunately, um, about people who, about the silencing that's happening, and these are the ones that obviously were made public. But what I think about a lot is what about the stories that we don't know about? What are about all the stories that people don't feel comfortable talking about? How many students at the University of Alaska or the University of Michigan are gonna think twice before they write satire, challenging the status quo? How many professors are going to change their, what they're teaching or avoid discussions or topics that are too controversial because they don't want to cause offense to people, they don't want to lose their livelihood. Um, I interviewed a lot of professors when I was writing my book and I heard a lot of horror stories about people who had, had suffered retaliation for having the wrong views. Um, one person in particular was a, actually somebody I know, it's a friend who had been passed over for a um, for a job because she had been suspected of being conservative, correctly, I and mean, she was a conservative, um, but it was, it was actually put in writing, which I think sort of shows you the shamelessness of this, that they don't even feel that there's anything wrong with it anymore. Um, and you know, you might be a person who says, I don't really care, you know, I don't really care if conservatives are being discriminated against, I think they're stupid, you know, and frankly, I have a lot of people who say that to me. Um, but what I would say to that is that I think you need to stop and think about how important intellectual diversity is. Um, and that I think liberals had it right the first time. Diversity matters. Um, it, 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 it's important if you want to, um, if you don't want to just, like I said, have things handed down to you and have sort of received wisdom, that, that we want to have intellectual diversity and have people saying things that we disagree with so that we can um, really try to find out what's, what's actually true. And, and NYU professor Jonathan Haidt has written a lot about this. He's not a conservative. He calls himself a liberal turned centrist. Um, but he talked about how when he was preparing for a speech uh, to, a, to a group of his colleagues, he wanted to, it was about intellectual diversity, and he wanted to talk to some conservative social psychologists. He couldn't find any, and so instead he opted for two people who were not liberal but not conservative. They were sort of independents. But he said even these people who themselves were not conservatives felt that they had to hide their identities. He said they were like um, closeted gay people in the 80s. Um, who, who felt that if they let people see who they were or what they believed, um, that they would be, that they would not be able in academia, and it led them to, I mean, one of them said, I'm just not gonna be able to pursue this because I, I think I can do good research, but it's gonna be, reach the wrong conclusions. And he said, you know, that this is harming science. This is harming, um, you know, the kinds of findings that we're having, the kinds of work we could be doing. Um, but unfortunately, we seem to be headed in, in the direction of less intellectual diversity, not more. Um, the liberal professor that I mentioned earlier, uh, who wrote anonymously at Vox, said that the way that he was reacting to what was happening was that he, would, he scrubbed his class syllabus to avoid anything that might offend a liberal um, student. And I, I get that. 
you know, I understand. Like, people have worked hard to get to where they are, um, and they have put a lot into their jobs, and um, I think they're afraid. Um, and so it's an understandable response, but I think it's, it's ultimately the wrong response, and I think it's the wrong response because I, this really is a war of inches. It's inch by inch, they're just sort of chipping away um, at free expression and chipping away at the idea you know, that, that we share about free expression. And it's, it started with silly complaints about Taco Tuesdays and trigger warnings and safe spaces, and it's moved on to you know, cast certain viewpoints as being you know, acts of violence. And I think, you know, where is this going to end? Um, and someone asked me earlier today, like, doesn't, do you think it's rising or falling? And I said, well, why would it be falling? They're so successful. They're having such success. Why would they stop doing it? It doesn't make any sense. It's not going to collapse under the weight of the absurdity, which is what a lot of people believe. And I think for the students who are in the audience, I would say, you know, you have a responsibility to, to stand up for this. And that's why I love to talk to students, you know, to stand up for free speech. Um, and I like to use a story of, of somebody I know named David French to sort of show you, um, you know, I think how, how you can engage with, with culture if you are a person, really doesn't matter where you fall, um, whether you're liberal or conservative or not, but he happens to be someone who is conservative. He was, he's a Harvard Law, he went to Harvard Law, he's an evangelical, um, and he was serving on the admissions committee at Cornell Law School. And they got together and they had a student who had been brought before the admissions committee and he looked at it and he thought, why is this person here? And he's a slam dunk, he should never be come, come before the committee, he should have been accepted immediately. And then he realized what was going on. Uh, as as the application was passed around, he looked down and he saw that um, he had been, people had written on the application that they didn't want a Bible-thumping student who might be part of the God Squad on their campus. And so French spoke up and he said, look, you know, if you think this person's bad, then I'm a fundamentalist. And um, he said that the room, the, all the energy shifted in the room, that people really were legitimately embarrassed and chagrined, and that they, um, they really, you know, realized that their idea that they had been told of what evangelicals were like didn't comport with what they'd experienced with David. Um, and the committee ended up voting the student in. And he told me that episode taught me a couple things. First, anti-Christian discrimination can be reflexive. And second, a little bit of true intellectual diversity can go a long way towards reversing its effects. These folks were my friends, yet their biases were deeply ingrained. But I do have to wonder what would happen if he hadn't been there. And I think probably the student wouldn't have, would have been rejected. And I think it would have been bad for the student, but it would have been bad for the university too. Um, so to me, the moral is clear. Uh, and I think it's, you know, whether you're a liberal or conservative or agnostic, I just encourage people to go into unlikely places and make unlikely friends. And debate people who disagree with you. Question your biases. I guarantee you have them. Uh, you know, consider the possibility that you might be wrong about a couple things. It's, it's just a possibility. I'm not saying it's definitely true. Um, and you know, and I think that um, for students, you need to really learn to debate and learn how to articulate your views and don't and um, and and be around people who are different than you. Um, and I just you know, don't let anybody ever tell you that expressing a point of view is an act of violence or that the First Amendment goes too far. Um, because I just, the fate of free speech really is in all of our hands at this point, and I just, I just say let's not let them take another inch. Thank you. <laughs>